Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome everybody and Chag Sameach on this last night of Hanukkah. My name is Terry Swartz Russell. I'm the Director of Family and Adult Education at Temple Emanuel. And we were thinking of, you know, we still haven't seen a lot of each other together. Um, so we're still doing Zoom and we thought let's do something fun. And we looked around and we found our uh, presenter for tonight, Seth Front, and I want to just tell you a little bit about him, and then I'm going to turn the program over to Seth. Seth is a comedian and a rabbi's son who uses humor to emotionally connect Jews to their heritage and faith. He's a graduate of the USC School of Cinema and Television, where he co-wrote the film comedy Nickel and Dime. Uh, in 2009, he turned a joke about the Jewish deli, Jewish deli food Zodiac into a gift company called Jewish Zodiac, and he is going to teach us or tell us about tonight's program, um, which is a culinary history of Jew Jews in America based on the astrological signs of the delicatessen. So I'm going to let welcome Seth and let him take it away. And uh, you get to ask questions later. So but for now, everyone should remain on mute so that you can get the most out of the CESS program. Okay, welcome, Seth. Thank you, Terry, and thank you to all the Terrys out there tonight. <laughs> um, let's get going. Okay. It was 20th century author and journalist Damon Runyon who said it best. He said, there are two kinds of people in this world. There are people who love delicatessens and those you shouldn't associate with. I'm Seth Front and I'll be your host for a culinary history of Jews in America based on the astrological signs of the delicatessen. I'm also the creator of the Jewish Zodiac which is a deli food parody of the Chinese Zodiac. Now I bet you're all wondering, where did I come up with such a Meshuggah idea? Well, I came up with it at a place where good things always happen to Jews, a Chinese restaurant. I was sitting at a Chinese restaurant, looking at the Chinese Zodiac place map, and I looked up and I realized that everyone in the restaurant was Jewish. It was not Christmas day. And all of a sudden, the clouds parted, the angels sang. They were Jewish angels. They were playing Mahjong at the time. And God spoke to me and he said two words, Jewish Zodiac. And I thought, well, what would a Jewish Zodiac be? It wouldn't be year of the dragon or year of the ox. It would be uh, year of the bagel and year of the lox. It would be deli food. But how do you personify, for instance, uh, a bagel? Well, if you were born in the year of the bagel, and you can see the years right there, 19, I'll go a little bit further back, 1924, 36, 48, 60, 72, and so on. If you were born in the year of the bagel, you're pliable and always bounce back, although you feel something's missing in your center. If this persists, get some therapy. Compatible with schmear and locks. Lotkin Kanisha, not so much. So I took the 12 most popular and iconic deli foods, and I created this Jewish Zodiac placement. I created all the text, all the years, all the foods, the 12 most popular and iconic deli foods. And then I worked with an artist who grew up near Coney Island, and we created, there we are. We created these 12 retro 50s logos which we'll use to tell, which we'll use as guideposts to tell the story, the history of Delhi in America, which really comes down to four stages. Arrival of Delhi, the adaptation of Delhi, third generation post-war assimilation of Delhi, and the stage we're in now, which is the return to authenticity. Before we get into that timeline, I'd like to go back so a few different dates, 1654 is when the first Jews come to America, 23 Jews from Recife, Brazil. Uh, they come up to New Amsterdam, which is what um, 
uh, New York was called back in 1654. And they were Sephardic Jews. They weren't Ashkenazic Jews. So the first Jews to settle in America were Sephardic Jews. Then in 1830, from 1830 to 1880, we had our first minor immigration. About 400,000 um, German Jews came to America. They were well-educated. They were from the city. They came one family here, one family there. And they settled all across America, some in the Eastern Seaboard, some down in the South, some as far as San Francisco, like Levi Strauss, who founded the Jeans Company. Um, my great great uncle, Jacques Front, he was a maker of wigs and toupees, and uh, now you know why it's the genetic in our family. He settled in the Midwest, in Wheeling, West Virginia, of all places. And uh, there is my family roots, my grandfather, Henry Mark, my father, Rabbi Henry Front, and myself, we are all, we were all customers as well as uh, relatives. But most Jews in this period settled in the Midwest. I guess they figured, you know, they got to the Midwest and they didn't want to schlep two sets of dishes any further. So they settled in the Midwest. Cincinnati was the major Jewish town of the era. That's where Rabbi Isaac Mayer, Mayer Wise founded the Hebrew Union College, the Reform Seminary. Now, my father very uh, graduated Hebrew Union College class in 1955. That's him in the first row, just left of center, which also describes his politics, by the way. But the Hebrew Union College is not famous for my father's graduating class, but rather their first graduating class because it was such a great honor to have this first class that they had a huge banquet that is now uh, known as the Trefa banquet, the non-kosher banquet, because they served milk with meat and, and unkosher items like little neck clams and uh, ice cream and things like this. It was a Shonda. And the Orthodox Jews who were there immediately walked out of the banquet. And in fact, some Reformed Jews walked out as well and basically started the conservative movement from this, uh, from this banquet. But what's interesting about the menu, and you can see it here written in French, it really symbolizes the difference between these German Jews who were wealthier and cultured versus the Jews who would come later from the Eastern Bloc, from Poland, and the Soviet Union who were, who were really poor immigrants. And, and this was a meal that they wouldn't even understand, let alone the, fat, the French in it. But Cincinnati was also a food town and there were Jews there as well, including the Fleischmann brothers who produced the first commercially produced yeast. And also Manischewitz was founded in 1888 in Cincinnati, Ohio, Rabbi Dove Manischewitz and his blushing bride, uh, Nesha, still clutching her handbag as if the Cossacks might be coming at any moment. I like to take a post-feminist spin on this picture though. He might've known the laws of Kashrut, but perhaps her holding the purse strings, maybe she was the one who truly ran the business. Let's look at it that way. But anyway, Cincinnati was a food town also and Procter & Gamble was there, not a Jewish company, but they see these about 15, 20,000 Jews not purchasing their lard based shortening. So they create vegetable shortening for the Jews. It's the first time in America that a non-Jewish company creates a product for the Jews. And in doing so, it becomes popular nationwide. Now, Crisco actually started marketing um, their pure vegetable oil by saying, this is the shortening the Hebrews have waited 4,000 years for. I'm not making that up. Another great example of this was the Heinz Company. In about the 1930s, Orthodox rabbis went to them and said, we can't eat your pork and beans. Can you please make vegetarian beans? And it became more popular than even the pork and beans. Of course, the rabbis passed an edict saying you could not eat the beans before coming to shul on Friday night. So that's a little prehistory. Let's get into the arrival, 1881. In Russia, Tsar Alexander II, he's actually a relatively modern Tsar. He wants to create two houses of parliament to give the serfs a little bit of power because if he doesn't give them power, they'll assassinate him, they'll overthrow him. 
As soon as he announces this, people within his own monarchy assassinate him anyway. But let me ask you, who do you think gets blamed for the assassination? Let's say it together on three. One, two, three, the Jews. Of course, we get blamed for it. So let's say you're Tevya. You're out in a poor shtetl in the middle of Russia, somewhere around there. What do you have to look forward to? Pogroms, poverty, and conscription into the army. So the rabbi of the little shtetl and of the little towns all across the Eastern Bloc, they say, we're leaving as an entire community. We've all seen Fiddler on the Roof, right? As an entire community, we're getting up and leaving. And that's what happened. These poor immigrants come to America. They get on these boats. They come, they pass by um, the Statue of Liberty with the famous poem by uh, Emma Lazarus, who, by the way, she was actually a descendant of one of the 23 original Sephardic Jews who came to this country. That's pretty amazing. I just learned that fact a couple of weeks ago. Um, and they settle in the Lower East Side. Two and a half million Jews in this period come to America. The Lower East Side, as I like to refer to it as Jewish Plymouth Rock. This was the most densely populated area on earth. And I, and, and these, this is, I say Jewish Plymouth Rock because these were the most photographed Jews in history. You know, we don't have pictures per se of the shtetls back in, in Eastern Europe, but these were the most photographed Jews in history. Well, at least until this woman came along. So what would you do if you were an immigrant and living in a tenement? You'd probably work in the garment industry perhaps in an actual tenement or in a factory. But if you were Tevia, and remember Tevia had a milk cart, he was the dairy man. He would put, push a push cart through, through the shtetl. He'd probably have a push cart here in America because America was an easy, uh, a push cart was an easy entry into, bit, into the business world in America. So the question is, what are the Jewish Zodiac foods that immigrants brought with them directly from Eastern Europe and that hasn't changed, that haven't changed at all. One of them is the Kanish. And as I go through the Jewish zodiac symbols, make note of which symbol you are, okay? Um, year of the Kanish, flaky on the surface, you're actually a person of depth and substance. Consider medical or law school, but don't get too wrapped up in yourself. Compatible with pickle. Avoid, uh, avoid lots who's out of your league. Now the Kanish became iconic to the city of New York and Yona Schimmel is perhaps the most famous Kanish maker of all. Now his story is very much the story of almost every Jewish immigrant during this period who entered into the food business. He had a great recipe and along with his cousin Joseph Berger, he had a push cart originally. And originally he was actually a rabbi and a Hebrew teacher. Um, and in 1910, he decided to open up his shop. Why 1910? We'll find that out a little bit later. But the Kanish became iconic to the city of New York. And even up to the 1980s, they could be found on almost every other street corner. They were so iconic to the city of New York that the New York Times wrote in the 1970s that no one could be elected to any office in the city of New York without first having a photo opportunity down at Yona Schimmel's and having someone take a picture of them shoving a knish into their mouth. In fact, if you go to the Museum of the City of New York, you'll see this painting, the Yona Schimmel Knish Bakery. And of course, the reason why the Knish was so popular is it was a great item that you could just take with you on your way. And we Jews, we were so poor, we knew what to, we knew we had so many recipes for potatoes and the Knish being the most popular one. Now, another food which we brought with us directly from Eastern Europe was the pickle. Year of the pickle. You're the perfect sidekick. Friends love your salty wit and snappy banter, but you never overshadow them. That shows genuine seasoning from when you were a cucumber. Marry a pastrami later in life. Now, back in Eastern Europe, you know, there wasn't refrigeration, so we had to take the bounty of the spring and summer and preserve it for the fall and winter. So we were the true pickle makers and we were the true pickle eaters. 
And in fact, the term pickle eater was the term that the, Amer the Americans, the people who were already in America would call us. They'd call us pickle eaters. And let me tell you, that was a pretty nasty slur back at the turn of the century. But if you were a kid and you had a penny, your mother gave you a penny, you'd buy a pickle for the sour and you'd buy a piece of candy for the sweet. And that was what you would eat. And of course, we had guys like Gus on the Lower East Side of Gus's Pickles and the pickle guys with the ubiquitous wooden barrels that we all grew up with at our local delis. They're all now in Williamsburg. Um, so pickles were incredibly popular and is another food which we brought with us directly from Eastern Europe. Now, there were also the, the bagel or pretzel guys there in the fish market. There was the, the guys who would sell herring and the way they would sell um, the herring, the pickled herring was they would take newspaper and they'd wrap it into a cone and they would drop the herring into the cone and you could eat it on your way to work. Now, your breath would probably get there about three minutes before you did, but this was how they sold herring. Now, this is a, one of the earliest movie films ever called Move On by Thomas Edison. And what you see are the pushcart vendors on the street of New York. And it was such an easy entry into the business life and especially into the food business life of America that the streets were actually teeming with push carts. So in 1906, the city of New York decided that they were gonna give out licenses to these push carts. And they were only gonna give out a limited number of licenses. So some people actually lost their businesses. But in typical uh, wisdom of uh, city government, the New York City says, well, we're gonna give you a license, but you have to stay in one place. What's the point of a push cart if you can't push it down the road? That happens in 1906. And that's why a few years later, like in 1910 for Jonas Schimmels, they decide if I gotta be in one place all day, I might as well have a roof over my head. And I'm gonna let this film play just a little bit longer because pretty soon here he comes, you see the cops coming down the street telling the push cart vendors to move on. And in a minute here, we're going to see this Keystone cop shake his fist at the immigrant Jew. But let me tell you, that was a lot nicer treatment than we would have gotten back in Eastern Europe. You could read all about this in a great book called 97 Orchard, which is an edible history of five immigrant families in the Lower East Side. And those families were Irish, uh, Italian, German, Jewish German, and Russian. So that was the first stage, arrival, the foods that we arrived with. So let's talk about the second stage, the second generation of Jews, the ones who were born here in America, adaptation. And when I think of adaptation, I think of the year of the pastrami. pastrami. Brisket's hip or sibling, always smoking and ready to party. You spice up life even if you keep your parents up at night. Compatible with pickle, who's always by your side. Now, one reason why the pastrami is so compatible with pickle is it's, it is pickled itself. The, the pastrami process starts with the pickling of the meat. And in fact, it comes from the word to preserve. Now, if you were Tevye, and remember Tevye had the cow, he was a dairyman, he would not have killed his cow just to make a pastrami sandwich. They did not, beef is really an American food item. It wasn't an Eastern European item. And in fact, on the rare occasion that they would even have pastrami, they would actually make it out of geese of all things back in Eastern Europe. And we know this from this book, the Settlement Cookbook, a cookbook I'm sure many of you uh, either have or have inherited from your mothers and grandmothers. How many recipes involve geese or goose fat in that book? Many, many. But uh, the pastrami sandwich symbolized the hopes and dreams of our ancestors. Our hopes and dreams 
where it's piled high as the slices in a pastrami sandwich. And pastrami and meat was a wonderful business to be in. And the people who really made money in uh, the deli business were the beef manufacturers who really were like the bank. If you wanted to open up a deli and, and really in the day, there were 1500 uh, meat delis and about 150 appetizing shops. But these delis were really more like luncheonettes. They weren't like the huge palaces that many of us frequent today. They were really New York luncheonettes. But if you were an immigrant and you wanted to open a luncheonette, you'd basically say to a meat manufacturer, loan me the money and he'd loan you the money. And of course you pay him back, you know, by, by buying his meat. It was a huge business equivalent today of $3 billion a year, but they controlled the prices as well. In fact, there were four major riots and strikes when the price of beef got too high. The most famous one was in 1902, where the price of kosher beef went from 12 cents a pound to 18 cents a pound. And the women of the Lower East Side, they got together and they decided they were not going to allow anyone to buy any meat whatsoever. They patrolled the streets of the Lower East Side. And in fact, they, they ransacked some of the buildings. They took the beef out, they threw it on the street, they doused it with kerosene and they lit it on fire. That is not how we get the term hot pastrami, but they ended up breaking the trust of these, uh, there was a huge meat trust and they ended up breaking the trust, something even Teddy Roosevelt couldn't do. And it was really the first time that, that Jewish women gathered together for social change and, and everything that happened through the 20th century and even to today with uh, social, social movements, I like to think it starts here in 1902. Now, uh, Isaac Gellis was a meat manufacturer and he would plow his profits into the Elder Street Synagogue, which is actually in Chinatown. I don't know if any of you have been there. Uh, they just recently redid their um, stained glass window. It's now called the Museum at Elder Street and it's in Chinatown. And every year to celebrate the diversity of the Jews and the Chinese in this, um, in this neighborhood, they have an event called the Egg Rolls and Egg Cream Festival. And in fact, now Hispanics have moved into the neighborhood. It's now called the Egg Rolls, Egg Cream and Empanada Festival. So we're celebrating the diversity and always through the diaspora, we're always adapting to uh, the cultures that we live in. Now we're in a Christian culture here in America. The Christian Holy Trinity is the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. But did you know that there's a Jewish Holy Trinity? bagels, lox, and cream cheese. One bite and you will find God. Now you would think bagels, lox, and cream cheese is something we brought with us directly from Eastern Europe. Uh, that was something that we arrived with, but no, it's actually been adapted here in America. Um, and I will explain. So let's start with lox. Year of the lox. Thin and rich, you're very high maintenance. All you wanna do is bask in the heat, get in some color. Consider retiring to Boca. Compatible with bagel and schmear, although you top them both. Lox was actually less expensive than beef back in the day. And, um, you know, we had the Pacific Northwest Rail Railroad that stretched across the country that was recent, that was built in the 19th century. And in, the, uh, in Seattle, in the Seattle area, they get the, the salmon from, from the ocean, they'd put it in barrels, they'd throw salt on it, they'd put it on the trains and would make its way all the way back east to New York. And by the time it got there, it was locks. Didn't need refrigeration, which was good because those, those railway cars were not refrigerated. So um, Joel Russ was a man who sold fish at the fish market. And eventually he opened up his store in the Lower East Side on Houston Street, Russ and Daughters. And by the way, the moniker Russ uh, and Daughters is actually the first time in America that any company was called and Daughters because almost everything up to that point was and Sons. It took a Jew to have the first business, which was and Daughters. It took a Jew and it took a Jew who had daughters as opposed to sons. So this was an appetizing store. There were about 150 of them during the heyday. And at an appetizing store, of course, you could get all sorts of fish like the old fashioned belly locks, which were the type of locks, the way they, they 
made it or manufactured it on in those barrels as they made it made its way across the nation. Nowadays, we really go more with the wild Western Noah, which is smoked. It's less fatty. It's less salty. It's healthier. And of course, you can get all sorts of cream cheeses there and all sorts of sandwiches with sable, cod, whatever you want, whitefish, my favorite. They recently opened up their own restaurant. But the term appetizing really comes from the appetizing store. So when you go to a deli and you see the meat section and the appetizing section, that's where they got it from. And even sometimes you get the, the bagels and appetizing. It's saying you can't get meat here, but you certainly can get lox and bagels. Now, let's talk about cream cheese. Year of the schmear. You blend well with others, but often spread yourself too thin. A smooth operator, you could use some spicing up now and then. Compatible with bagel and lox. Avoid pastrami, wouldn't be kosher. Now, this is where we really get into it. You would think that we had cream cheese back in Eastern Europe and we brought it with us, but that's not the case. We had something more akin to creme fraiche, but we really didn't have cream cheese. And I know this because cream cheese was invented by a New York dairy man named William Lawrence in upstate New York. He's trying to make a fancy French cheese called Neuf Chatel, and it comes out wrong. It comes out as this spreadable creamy cheese, puts it on some bread. Everyone likes it, so he decides to market it. And of course, he's from the state of New York. He's very proud of the state of New York, very proud of the city of New York. So naturally, he calls his cream cheese Philadelphia brand cream cheese. Why didn't he call it New York cream cheese? Well, the culinary capital in, eight, in the 1880s, the culinary capital of the United States was Philadelphia. That's where the Continental Congress had been. So thus, that's where the best chef, chefs were and the best restaurants. That was the culinary capital of the United States. So he wanted to associate this bastardized version of, of French cheese with quality. And quality meant Philadelphia and not New York. Maybe 40 years later, it would have meant New York, but that's how we get Philadelphia brand cream cheese. So there were there were some dairy um, delis, you know, it was separate because it was all kosher. There were meat delis and, and dairy delis like Ratner's, which was probably the most famous. And at a place like Ratner's, you could get a blintz. Year of the blintz. Creamy and dreamy, you're rightfully cautious to travel in pairs. You play it coy, but word is with the right topping, you turn over morning, noon, and night. Compatible with schmear. When I think of a blintz, it comes from the old Slavic term lin to mill. I really think of how we take our culinary uh, laws and we apply them to whatever kinds of foods and, and, food, and food culture we're living in. And I always think of really a, a, a blintz as nothing but a really a, a fancy crepe, to be quite honest. Um, another food which you could find at, uh, at a place like Ratner's was a latka. And so we're celebrating hot Hanukkah, year of the latka. Working class with a grating exterior, you're a real softy on the inside. Kind of plain naked, but when dressed up, you're a real dish. Compatible with Schmier's cousin sour cream. Now, latka was a bit of a switch hitter. You could find it with applesauce, um, perhaps at a meat deli, but if you wanted it with sour cream, you'd have to find it in a place like Ratner's. But, you know, I just think about the fact that we knew, we knew how to do so many things with potatoes back in Eastern Europe. We had so many dishes, and of course, the knish and the latka are just two of those dishes. Like I said, it was a little bit of a switch hitter. You could find it everywhere. Now, Ratner's, as you see here in the corner on the right, Ratner's was in the theater district and we had men like Eddie Cantor, Milton Berle, Groucho Marx, Jewish entertainers entertaining in, on Broadway and off Broadway. And oftentimes they'd go to the deli afterwards and they'd invite their friends, both Jewish friends and non-Jewish friends. And the non-Jewish friends would come to the deli and they'd say, wow, it's a great, corned beef sandwich, a pastrami sandwich, but there's one thing that would make it even better. A slice of cheese. So you've taken over the deli from your immigrant father. You were born in America. You're sitting here going, 
why shouldn't I put a slice of cheese on this sandwich? I want to appeal to everyone, the Jews and non-Jews. And after all, I'm, I was born here in America. I, I don't believe in that old way of doing things. And why do I have to pay for mashkiach to, to take some of my profits and look over my shoulder and eat, and eat my food all day long? Why do I have to be a kosher deli? And that's how we get the rise of the New York deli, the kosher style deli that really isn't kosher at all. And all these places are always connected to the theater district as a result, like the stage deli. And suddenly, all of the Jewish foods are under one roof. And that's what's important about the rise of the New York deli. Every, every food is under one roof, whether it's now you can have a corned beef sandwich with, with a slice of cheese on it, the blints can come to the party, the bagels, lots and cream cheese can come to the party, you can have a corned beef sandwich with an all-American side of coleslaw, places like the Carnegie, celebrating all the famous name, name, naming everything after actors and, and other famous New York theater people. And suddenly within a generation, a pastrami sandwich goes from symbolizing the hopes and dreams of our ancestors to now symbolizing a heart attack on a plate. Now, I love pastrami sandwiches, and I'm sure you do too. How far would you go for a pastrami sandwich? Hmm? I'm ashamed to admit it, but last week I went to Shiva just for the deli spread. The other great thing about the delis were the warm, friendly Jewish waitress who would tell you what to eat and how to eat. She'd order for you. She'd tell you, this is what you're ordering. You're going to like it, and don't give me any guff. She was part of the entertainment of going to the deli. And in fact, the deli was the third place that Jews went to. The first place, of course, was the synagogue to pray. The second place was the Jewish social club to find a spouse. But when you really wanted to relax and let your hair down, you went to the deli. It was the third place. And what I find so interesting about the third place is the fact that growing up in Brooklyn in the 1950s, was the CEO of Starbucks, Howard Schultz. And he always refers to Starbucks as the third place. The first place being home, the second place being work, and the third place being Starbucks. And let me tell you, he got that idea from the Jewish deli. Also during this period in the 20s and 30s, we had entertainers like Gertrude Berg with her radio show and eventually her sitcom the rise of the Goldberg, which is a precursor to I Love Lucy, espousing all American values from a Jewish point of view. And within a generation, we were slowly being accepted into American society. Unfortunately, in 1924, uh, the Senate passed the johnson Reed Act, which curtailed immigration, and especially immigration of Jews from Eastern Europe. And this was the heyday of the Jewish deli, but it was gonna slowly die off because one, because we were no longer having immigration from Eastern Europe because of this act. And then of course, because of the rise of Nazi Germany and World War II. So let's get into stage three, the third generation, <clears throat> post-war assimilation. The war is over, the highways are built, the suburbs arise. And if you're in Brooklyn, perhaps, wake up one morning, you're thinking, should I go? Should I stay? You wake up to this. Even my baseball teams are leaving. So Jews leave New York City for the suburbs and for all of America. And that's also one reason why the delis slowly die in New York. And so when I think of assimilation, probably the most assimilated deli food is the bagel. You're the bagel, as I said before. You're pliable and always bounce back, although you feel something's missing in your center. If this persists, get some therapy. Now, bagels were originally all handmade. Everything was handmade by the Bagel Bakers Union. And that is not a typo. That would how they spelled bagel back in the day. And this is probably the only time you ever saw them in a tux because usually they were in, in white t-shirts and aprons because it was pretty hot making those bagels with those hot ovens. Uh, it was all unionized. That was the only way you could become a bagel maker, but every bagel was made by hand. 
And in 1950s, they went on strike. The New York Times referred to it as the bagel famine because you could not find a bagel in New York City at all. They went on strike because they wanted more money and they got more money. It's very funny that uh, now, that it, now that I talk about this just briefly, there's a bagel famine in the 1950s. But today I was reading, I think I read in the New York Times, my, my sister sent this to me, that uh, there's a cream cheese shortage because of uh, right now in New York City because of the supply chain problems. There a lot of a lot of bagel places are having a hard time finding the amount of cream cheese uh, that they actually need. Uh, look it up online. It's very fascinating. So anyway, they they struck and they got their raise and it didn't matter because within 10 or 15 years, they were going to all be out of business because of this man, Dan Thompson, who creates the Thompson bagel machine, an automated bagel machine to do the job of the bagel union men. And, and it, this makes the perfect bagel, the perfect kind of bland, overstuffed, characterless bagel that we're pretty much used to nowadays. Uh, another man responsible for bagels is Harry Lender, who comes from Minsk in the early 1920s, one of the last immigrants to leave the Eastern Bloc. And he settles in New Haven, Connecticut, and he has a big uh, bakery with a huge wholesale business along with his son, including Murray on the right. And sometimes he had such a huge business, he couldn't make all the bagels on Friday for it to ship out for the weekend. Sometimes he had to make them on Wednesday and freeze them and then thaw them out like overnight, Thursday night, so, so he could sell, sell them to his customers. And his son Murray says, hey dad, why don't we take these frozen bagels and put them in plastic and sell them to the markets around America? And that's how we get lenders bagels and lenders bagels. So between the lenders and the Thompsons, that's how um, bagels become so assimilated across America. Now, another Jewish food, deli food that's been assimilated is chicken soup. You're the chicken soup. You're a healer nourishing all whom you encounter. We feel better just being in your presence. Mothers want to bring you home to meet their children. Resist this at all costs. Compatible with bagel and knish. So everyone knows what Jewish penicillin is. And if you were an immigrant, you almost always made it at home with the bones of the chicken. You wouldn't, you would use every part of the chicken. Um, in the 50s, you know, in the 50s, there was food industrialization. And even Manischewitz with their matzo ball mix was, was getting into that business. I grew up in the 70s. I subsisted on this. My mother didn't make chicken soup very much. I subsisted on Campbell's chicken noodle soup. And uh, I've had many years of therapy as a result. But um, you didn't have to go to the deli anymore. And that's another reason why the delis were dying out. You get all these things at your local market. Manischewitz was in that business. And here, here's a great example of this, Gabilis Knishes. Here's a photograph from 1915 with the word kosher right on their truck. Who do you think they're selling to? They're selling to Jews. Yet 15 years later, you see potato, king of the potato pie. They're explaining to a new non-Jewish audience what a knish is. And then in the 50s, cocktail specialties. We're trying to, you know, this is, we're trying to go from members of the tribe to members of the country club. And I think our Jewish foods got there before we did. Uh, and then in the seventies, assorted cocktail specialties. And look at that logo. Does that logo remind you of any other Jewish food company's logo? Yeah, Hebrew National. Looks just like Hebrew National. They were of course manufacturing for mass markets as well. And of course, we had Levy's rye bread. Why does Buster Keaton look so sad? He's eating a mass-produced rye bread that isn't quite up to snuff as the thing that you could get, the, the rye bread that you could get at your local bake, Jewish bakery with the cornmeal crust, which is just so satisfying. Even Isaac Gellis was bought out by Mogan David, who was bought out by ConAgra. And, those, and at least Isaac Gellis brand is no longer. You can go to Costco now and you can get, you can get vacuum sealed pastrami. 
not quite the genuine article that you can get at places like Katz's, also on the Lower East Side, where they, where they still slice it by hand. Where Meg Ryan had her orgasm in When Harry Met Sally. And where uh, you could, during the war, you could send a salami to, the boy in your, to, to your boy in the army. It actually rhymes if you say it with the right accent and you don't trip over your own tongue. And most famously, I, I love this story, the presidential election, 1972, Nixon versus McGovern, Mc, Nixon, the incumbent, of course. So George McGovern is trying to, to capture the Jewish vote of New York City and New York State. So he goes down to Katz's for a photo op and he's got all the photographers around him. And in one hand, he's got a kosher hot dog. Great, got a kosher hot dog in one hand. And, and in the other hand, to wash it down, he's got a glass of milk. Schmuck, where's the Dr. Browns? Did you not have a Jewish staff member to put a Dr. Browns in your hand? He loses New York City. He loses New York State because he does not know the laws of Kashrut. Which brings us to what he should have known, which was authenticity period we're in now, the fourth generation. And I think it really begins in 1972 with that famous Hebrew national commercial, we answer to a higher authority. During the 50s and 60s, we go into the suburbs, we're trying to blend in, we're trying to assimilate. But suddenly in the 70s, we're feeling a little bit more comfortable with ourselves. We say, we answer to a higher authority. We're taking back our, our Jewish pride. We see that, of course, in a movie like Annie Hall, where it's suddenly in 1977, hip to be a Nevishin New York Jew. Maybe I should say neurotic New York Jew. And then of course, crossing Delancey, the old world wisdom of the pickle man and reaching its heights in the 1990s with the most popular sitcom of all, Seinfeld, which now I know George Costanza is supposedly Italian, but no, you're not kidding me. These are four crazy Jews running around New York City. And in fact, Jerry Seinfeld is responsible for the popularity of one of the Jewish Zodiac foods, that being the black and white cookie. You're the black and white. Kids love you, but make up your mind. Are you black or white? Cake or cookie? You say you're new age, all yin and yang? We call it bipolar. Sweetie, you're most comfortable with yourself. So in an episode of Seinfeld, he's explaining to Elaine, if only the races in New York City could get along as well as the white frosting and the dark frosting on a black and white cookie. And he sees an African-American man also in the bakery eating, eating a black and white cookie. They acknowledge each other and there's perfect harmony in New York City. And because of this episode, uh, black and white cook cookies become even more popular than they were. And in fact, at Cantor's here in Los Angeles, they sell about 400 a day or at least they used to. For the pandemic. When I'm in New York City, I love going down to Junior's and on the, I think it's the Upper East Side, William Greenberg Jr., you can get black and white cookies in any color you want. So let's talk about Cantor's for just a moment. I don't know if any of you have been to Cantor's in, on, in Fairfax uh, in Los Angeles. They were originally from New Jersey and they moved out in the, uh, in the 30s, as we were moving out here, they moved to Boyle Heights, which was where Jews originally settled in Los Angeles. And this was their first delicatessen. <coughs> and I mentioned that the delis in New York, New York were really um, luncheonettes. And even this deli looks like a luncheonette with a few tables and a little counter. And that was pretty much it. And then they moved to the Fairfax district as Jews moved westward in Los Angeles and eventually took over a movie theater, which is why their awning is the way it is. And it's got two, two and a half rooms, very large rooms, huge, huge restaurant. If you're in LA, one, one of the places to go in LA for deli food. And another reason why delis die out in the fifties is it really takes an entire family to run a deli, especially if you have page upon page upon page of deli items, you know, where you're selling Jewish deli foods, but you're also selling Chinese chicken salad and Italian meatballs and, and spaghetti because God forbid we should ever turn anybody away. And that was another problem 
in the 50s and 60s, we, we kind of lost our way in terms of recognizing that a deli should really be a deli and nothing but. And a few other delis of note, Manny's in Chicago. You know, I love the fact that in the Midwest, I think people really love their corned beef, whereas on the coast, people love their pastrami. Zingerman's in Ann Arbor, there's a huge mail order business. Back in Los Angeles, Langer's uh, in downtown LA, they're not open at night. Um, they're famous for their legendary 19, not exactly a kosher sandwich. Um, but according to David Sachs, who wrote the book, Save the Deli, and Save the Deli is a great book. He went all around America and Canada to just about every deli he could find. And he rated, he thought that this was the best sandwich of all in Los Angeles. But now there's a new wave of younger men and women in their late 20s and early 30s who, who have created a new kind of farm to table movement of deli. And it really starts in, in, in Brooklyn with Mile End Deli. Noah Burnamoff is actually from Montreal and he is uh, studying law at, in uh, Brooklyn. And uh, on the weekends he would smoke um, a brisket, make pastrami out of it. And he decided he didn't want to be a lawyer. He really wanted to go into the deli business. So along with his wife, Ray, they open up Mile End. And once again, a couple tables and a counter, but, you know, harkens back, harkens back. They slice it by hand. Uh, they're like diamond cutters. Everything, they even make their own bagels and the menu. Here's the difference. Their menu is really the greatest hits. It's one page. It's one page, it's the greatest hits of deli. It's chicken soup, it's, it's um, bagels, lox and cream cheese, it's pastrami, it's really the greatest hits. And they're doing it all in house. That's what authenticity is. And in, in Oakland, California, there's Judy's Bagel Shop where they have uh, wood fired bagels, wonderful place, I've been there. Saul's in Berkeley, I've also been there. Really great uh, restaurant. Uh, Peter Levitt was trained by Alice Waters of Chez Panisse and Alice Waters was the person who really started the farm to table movement in America and Peter was trained by her. And in fact, um, Saul's Deli is literally one block from Chez Panisse on the north side of campus there. And, and if you go there, You'll see on the menu, you'll actually see brisket cured and brined and rubbed with garlic, paprika, coriander, and clove, and long smoked and steamed until tender. Reminding you that deli sandwiches, it's not a commodity, it's not a nostalgia trip. It really is a, queen, a cuisine unto itself. And in fact, you can't find Dr. Brown's there because this is Berkeley, they wanna keep a, a lower uh, carbon footprint. They make the drinks themselves. Up in Portland, there's Kenny and Zooks. This is another great story. Ken Gordon has a barbecue restaurant and one weekend he decides to smoke some pastrami. He sells them at the farmer's market. They sell out immediately. He says, I got to open up a deli. And once again, he's doing it all in house, all by hand, even the bagels. Um, and it's incredibly popular. That's in downtown Portland. Uh, Kenny and Ziggy's in Houston. Uh, Ziggy Gruber is a third generation deli man. Uh, his family's from New York. He's been trained at the Cordon Bleu. This is kind of an old fashioned deli with huge rooms. And, and you can see the posters, the movie posters and the theater posters in the back. You might remember him from the movie Deli Man. If you saw that documentary, you might be able to find that online. General Muir in Atlanta is another restaurant that has recently uh, sprung up uh, once again redefining what a deli can be. Wexler's Deli, uh, downtown Los Angeles, the Grand Central Market. They are famous for their smoked fish more than their, their corned beef or pastrami sandwiches, in fact. Um, but even this is their, their restaurant in Santa Monica, which kind of harkens back to um, uh, Russ and Daughters with the decor a little bit. Tanner's Deli for a while actually had a food truck which raises the question, is this a 21st century push cart? I think so. Everything new is old again when you return to, to the authenticity of these foods and how these foods get made. Now, there are certain 
Jewish Zodiac foods, which really def defy categorization. One of them being the egg cream. Year of the egg cream. You've got a devious personality since you're made with neither eggs nor cream. Friends find your pranks refreshing. Others think you're too frothy. Compatible with Blintz, who also has something to hide. Now, egg cream comes from the expression ech cream, which I believe is Yiddish for ech, meaning the genuine cream, because th there, there's all sorts of crazy stories about the egg cream. Nobody really knows how it was created. Some people said they came up with ech cream, the genuine cream, meaning they were actually using milk in it as opposed to just taking egg wipes and whipping it up at the top. Uh, and nobody really knows who invented the egg cream. Some, some people say uh, the Yiddish theater guy, Boris Tomaszewski, brought it back from France. But the, the story that makes the most sense is, is Louis Oster was in Brooklyn. He had a soda fountain. He had a candy shop with a soda fountain. He, he made his own chocolate syrup. And he's really the inventor of the egg cream. I think that's, that's the story that makes the most logical sense. And then he moved to St. Mark's Square, where a lot of these guys were, including Gem Spa, which would sell, you know, in the 1920s, when it was prohibition, the only high you could get was a sugar high. And they would sell uh, between two and 3,000 um, egg creams a day. If you were a tourist in New York City, you went into a cab and they said, you said, I want a taste of authentic New York. That's where they take you to Gem Spa. Uh, in Brooklyn, once again, the, the, the younger crowd, uh, they bought this pharmacy and turned it into a pharmacy with an F, soda fountain. It's an old time pharmacy and they've, they've got soda jerks. And what I love is the fact that, that they're selling egg creams along with everything else that they're selling. But at the beginning of the school year, they invite school kids from the neighborhood to on the first week of school at night to egg cream socials in their store. Parents have to stay outside and they teach them all about egg creams. I think that's great because egg creams, you know, aren't that popular, especially out West. People don't really know of egg cream. So how do you make an egg cream? You take a, a tall glass, cold glass, got a long tailed spoon. You pour in one inch of Fox's You Bet chocolate syrup and an inch of cold milk. Some people say you put in the cold milk first. You pour in cold seltzer about three quarters of the way up. You don't want it. You, you let it slide down the, down the uh, spoon. You don't really want to get it too head of foam quite yet. And you stir the drink very rapidly from the bottom and you create that head of foam. And that's how you make an egg cream. And there's the Fox's You Bet syrup. And that's the only way if you're not, don't, nothing, I don't want to hear from Hershey's, okay? But the question is, uh, is the egg cream going to survive in the 21st century? Now, if I were a deli owner, I swear, if I were a deli owner, if someone ordered an egg cream, I would bring all this to the table and I'd make it right in front of them. I'd ring a bell. I'd make a big deal out of it because it would be one, I'd sell a lot more egg creams. And also this probably costs less than 50 cents to make. You could sell for 350, you can make three bucks on just that. Whereas the margins on pastrami and corned beef are not that great. It's very hard to be a deli man. But is it going to survive in the 21st century? Is Kishka going to survive? in the 21st century. You don't see kishka on too many menus right now. Kishka, which I like to call Jewish haggis, tells you how much I like it. Um, you know, basically leftovers, schmaltz, uh, carrots, shredded carrots, all wrapped in an intestine. Uh, not my favorite food, but my friend Bernie from the Bronx says there's a very specific way to eat a kishka. You start by taking two Lipitor. Don't know if that's going to make it in the 21st century. Herring. You don't see herring on the menu anymore. Borscht. You rarely see borscht at a deli. Not very often. Tongue. I grew up in Philadelphia when I was very young. My father was a rabbi. We had deli spreads all the time. We had people over at our house. And every deli spread had roast beef, corned beef, pastrami, tongue, and turkey. And nobody would eat the turkey. Now there's no tongue. Is tongue going to survive in the tongue sandwich? No, no. And chopped liver. Chopped liver, a testament to our Eastern European ancestors and their ingenuity. They might have chicken once a week on Shabbat 
and they would take the livers, the parts that we throw away today if we even see them. They would take the livers and mash it up with, with the, the schmaltz, the chicken fat and the onions and the egg. And they would make an appetizer fit for a king. Now, historians rarely agree on anything, but they've come to a consensus that the greatest chopped liver ever made was my mother's. Year of the chopped liver. People either love you or hate you, making you wonder, what am I, chopped liver? But don't get a complex. You're always welcome at the holidays. And bagels got your back on it. So that is the last of the 12 Jewish zodiac symbols used to tell the story of the history of Delhi in America. These symbols, which God gave to me at the Chinese restaurant. But he gave me one other thing, and I'd like to share that with you today. And that's the Ten Commandments of Delhi. The Ten Commandments of Delhi. I am the Lord of Delhi. Thou shalt have no other foods before me. Thou shalt not take thy delicatessen's name in vain. Remember the Sunday brunch and keep it holy. On the seventh day, thou shalt nosh. Honor thy waitress and busboy. No mayo shall thou spread. No white bread shall thou serve. Thou shall not substitute. Thou shall not covet thy neighbor's plate. And thou shall not split the check. So Delhi in America, it's the story of four stages and the story of four generations of American Jews. But more than anything, it's the story of our far seeing Eastern European ancestors and their hunger for a better life for their children and grandchildren. I'd like to end with a joke. There's an old Jewish man on his deathbed in his home and his son walks by the room and the old man says, Son, son, come in. And, and the son says, Papa, Papa, what can I do for you? And the old man says, I can hear your mother downstairs in the kitchen. I can smell and I can tell that she's making her wonderful chopped liver. My final request is one last bite of chopped liver before I die. And the son says, sure, Papa, sure, Papa, anything for you. Let me go downstairs, I'll get the chopped liver and I'll be right back. So the son goes downstairs and comes back up a minute later, empty handed. And the old man says, no, so where's the chopped liver? And the son replies, mom said it's for after. It's funny because it's true. Think about it. What foods comfort us in the times of our greatest sorrow? And what foods do we celebrate with in the times of our greatest joy? From bris to shiva, and so many times in between, there's deli. So go, go to the deli. Take your children. More importantly, take your grandchildren. And if you don't have children, have some imprint upon their taste buds, the flavors of our culture, create new family memories centered around the original Jewish comfort food. Because when you take a bite of a pastrami sandwich or a sip of chicken soup, you're tasting your heritage. Thank you and bete avon. Thank you, Seth, that was great. I learned a lot. And yeah. you know, last year we did show um, the Deli Man. Um, oh, the movie two, Deli Man. Two years ago, when we could join together in, in person. So many of the people here have seen, seen that miraculous movie <laughs> and are, you know, quelling over it. Um, so Seth is willing to take some questions. Um, so if you have a, a question and you want to unmute yourself, um, please do so.
And, if you have a uh, if you have a question or if you have a story, I like the stories. I know there are a lot of people who either are, have family that was in the deli business or have great stories about deli. So I always love hearing those. Um, I have a question. Um, I loved your presentation and I, I grew up in Brooklyn. And um, is there any way for me to gain access to the wonderful Zodiac? contents because I wasn't constantly alert and there are some people I love who I can't um, really tell who they should marry based on the zodiac because <laughs> I missed their years. Well, um, so I used, so interestingly, I used to, my business started off selling the placemats and selling t-shirts and, and, and mugs and things like that. But that part of the business has kind of died off. But if you go online, and if you Google Jewish Zodiac or Jewish Delhi Zodiac, you should be able to find it. Thank you. That's, that's yeah. great. I saw it on your website, Seth. So I think it's there as well. Or YouTube videos. Maybe I saw it on YouTube videos. Yeah. So. I do I do have a YouTube channel which which actually has this on has the, right. uh, a recording of this speech on it. Okay, anybody else? Well, I can't believe it. You've answered all of our I have questions. a story. Oh, good. Marty, go ahead. I grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts. And Lowell, Massachusetts had um, immigrants mostly from Poland and Belarus. My grandfather was from Belarus from a place outside of Minsk called Kobrin and emigrated to the United States, lived in the Jewish section of Lowell called the Highlands. And many times there were Jewish merchants like you were talking about. And most of the time they went home for lunch. Well, as they got more prosperous and they worked downtown as merchants, uh, you know, furniture, whatever, uh, and they didn't want to go home for lunch. They thought it was more sophisticated to go to st stay downtown and eat. But the problem is there was no kosher deli. And so what they were going to do. So they found a kosher butcher named Barney Bellis, and they decided to raise money to put him in the deli business. <laughs> so all of the Jewish men could stay downtown to eat kosher food and schmooze while they were having lunch. Uh, that lasted, Barney's delicatessen lasted until about the 80s and was kosher up until that time. Great story, thank you. So my I, know, I know in Massachusetts, if I'm not mistaken, uh, black and white cookies are called half moons? Yeah. Sometimes? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So my story with Half Moon, my husband's from New York, and um, we have not yet found a black and white cookie that can compete with, you know, where he grew up. Um, he always rates them, and they're just not the same at all. <laughs> so uh, my story about that, my mother. Oh, go ahead. Uh, from Germany, and when she came to the United States to New York, when she was seventeen, she went to the bakery and she saw these black and white cookies and she looked at them and she wanted Americana and the person behind the counter didn't know what she meant but in Germany that's what they were called. Oh, that's funny. So I'm what sorry, were they what called? were they called again? Say that again? Americanas. They were called Americanas in Germany, the black and whites. So <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know the history of that at all. But, you know, it's just a story that she used to tell us and we used to eat black and whites and, and love them because of her. Hey, Terry, it's Karen. Dresner. Go ahead. It's really interesting. When my father started his deli in Newton, there were not very many Jews in Newton. People were saying to him, how are you going to open up a Jewish deli? There were no Jews there. <laughs> and, and, and he prospered and he did well. But it was like in 1950 when he opened, there were not a lot of Jews in Newton. Maybe they all followed his deli. <laughs> Maybe they did. Maybe they did. They were either going to Sharon and the South Shore he decided to go west. Yeah, Lou, Lou, Lou Snyder, go ahead. Uh, in Brookline, uh, when I came uh, uh, first to Boston in the 1950s, they had the famous Jack and Marion's. Oh yeah. And Jack and Marion's featured the skyscraper sandwich, which if you consumed it by yourself, your name was put up on the wall. And one of my good friends who went to MIT uh, actually ate a complete skyscraper sandwich himself. 
As I recall, it started with a whole loaf of rye bread <laughs> and then was filled with all the various delicacies. I was just wondering, did any other deli in the country try to do such a thing? Can you hear me? Where's yeah. the speaker? I, you didn't see I, his shrug? <laughs> I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. Um, I'm, well, you know, you know, the skyscraper sandwich really does come from the New York deli in a place like Carnegie. And, and it was such a novelty that I think other, other delis, you know, you, you know, you always say to it, you always get, when you go to a deli, it's always like, well, is it a big enough sandwich? You know, and really deli sandwiches are really oversized because you can't eat more than a half most of the time, you know, or yeah. The, uh, the other question I have is our favorite menu item at Jack and Marion's was oddly enough, the pastrami and eggs pancake style. Would you like to discourse on that? Would it ever enter your zodiac? No, that no. It, it, one, it would would not enter. But that's 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 like a rare kind of thing. I, I will say that that I did have a thirteenth zodiac sign, which didn't make it almost made the cut. It didn't was year the cheesecake, and <laughs> the yeah. cheesecake would be the the thirteenth Jewish zodiac. Oh, we have a question with from a woman in, in like a greenish uh, sweater. Yeah, yeah, also named Terry. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> I'm knitting Ruth. Well, Ruth, my um, husband's family was from New York, and maybe 30 years ago, we went to a store that was just called appetizing store. I'd never seen anything. I grew up here, and I went inside. And eventually the guy said to me, can I help you? And I said, no, I'm just smelling. Because <laughs> it was the best, the pickle barrel, the pastrami handmade. And my sister-in-law starts moving down the, away from me because <laughs> she brings this hick from Boston who just tells the guy that I was nuts. You're just smelling, he said. It was the best experience. That's a hilarious story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So I was in, uh, I was in New Jersey for, for Thanksgiving. And um, we were getting sushi at our favorite sushi store. And my daughters took a walk around the block. And there was a kosher deli. So the next day, before we got in the car to come back to Boston, we went to the kosher deli. And it was this narrow, narrow thing, you know, and, and uh, but it had like four different kinds of herring and uh, which we didn't buy, my sister-in-law bought, uh, but we got deli sandwiches and they, they were delicious. So it was, uh, it was a real treat. And the ones in Boston have closed. I mean, kosher delis in Boston have closed. So it's, it's very, very disappointing, you know. But everybody should know, and I'll shut up after this, everybody should know that uh, if you go to the butchery, they do make deli sandwiches. When I bought one two weeks ago, pastrami, and it was very good. <laughs> Paris is good too. Yeah, not kosher. Paris. So, yeah. Anybody else? A story, a song, uh, Dave, Marsha? Um, so I have a Carnegie deli story, and. Hopefully the puppy won't bark while I tell it. Um, so one of my sisters um, moved to Manhattan in the late eighties and she and her husband bought a tiny little apartment and the owners, it was one of their, of the Carnegie Deli, one of the owners, it was one of their first apartments and then kept it and they finally were selling it. And they really came to like my sister and her husband. So they said, well, when your family comes into town you know, come in and, and we'll make a special meal for you. So we all went in, we had a tablecloth, we had our own waitress. They said, if anybody famous comes in, we'll introduce them to you. And they were really disappointed because for a long time, nobody came in. And finally, Henny Youngman came in Whoa. and he said, he said to me, um, would you like a diamond pen? And I was in college at the time. And so I was like, sure. So he gave me a safety pin with a dime glued to it. So that was my Carnegie <laughs> Deli story. Great story. Steve. 
So Seth, thank you very much. It was a great presentation. So I have two, two bits on sort of modern aspect of Delhi. Uh, as we were listening to your presentation, we were eating Delhi that was sent to me as a Hanukkah present from my son in Virginia. And if people don't know about this, I'll show you something. So. Fragile. A gold, gold belly that was sent to, from child to parents. There's a service called Gold Belly that will send any kind of food from any restaurant that participates to you. And this came from Liebman's Kosher Deli Restaurants and Catering. And what arrived were half a dozen pieces of rye bread, pastrami, roast beef, pickles, uh, corned beef, knishes, et cetera, enough for a couple of meals. So I, I raised my son well. You so have that, a good son. <laughs> the, the second story has to do with Ziggy's Deli. We saw the movie a few years ago at a friend's party. And about that time, I had a young doctoral student at BU who moved with her husband to Houston. And I knew the deli was there and I mentioned it to her, but I thought no way would she ever go there. First, Houston is a big town. Second, she's African-American and she was about 30 years old. So I mentioned this to her and I feel like she's never going to, to know this place. And she says to me, Dr. B, we were there last week. We love it. And so... <laughs> There's there's a broad demographic for uh, for Delhi. Thanks who could, again. Who doesn't love Delhi? <laughs> there is a else? broader demographic for Delhi. Uh, that's very true. And and African American, yeah, they 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 love Delhi. And Liebman's is in the Bronx. Uh, yes. I have a friend who who lives in the Bronx. Well, I have a friend whose daughter lives in the Bronx, and so whenever she flies from L.A. To visit her, they, they've been there, and it's it's quite good. We we used to go there, and next door, uh, it's in Riverdale. Is was Mother's Bakery, and the two you just couldn't get a better combination. Unfortunately, Mother's is closed. So, Minna, did you want to say something? You're you're on mute. Okay. Yeah, just thank you. We enjoyed it very much. Um, yep. Yeah. <laughs> we, we were inspired to go search out some deli, except yeah. and we had we had deli while we walked. Actually, we, well, we, we made it simple. We had a hot dog. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. Yes. Louis, did you have something to add? Oh, it was Judy Strauss. I'm watching oh. it with. Her. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say my late husband used to say that the worst deli in New York is better than the best deli in Massachusetts. We just don't see if we get it. It doesn't last long. So, you know, it's yeah. unfortunate because those of us that were brought up that way really do miss it. And the appetizer store was, was a different elk because you really didn't eat there. You just kind of went to, to get yeah. the stuff. The, the yeah. whole world was in a better place when we had more delis. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you had to get whitefish, you know, the little chubs and stuff. Right. My dad used to get those. Yeah. So my first job after graduate school, I ended up in Boca Raton, Florida. And at that time, it's very Jewish. It wasn't so Jewish then. Um, I was their first uh, full-time hire at a synagogue. I was the director of youth and education. And um, in order to get kosher meat, I had to go to Miami because they didn't have anything up in Del Rey, in Boca, it didn't exist. Um, I'm not that old, but um, my mom came to visit. And she said, what can I bring you? And I said, go to Rubens, which is our Jewish kosher deli. And so she came and she opened her suitcase when she got to my apartment. And boy, did it smell great. <laughs> it was a trip. OK, anybody else? Oh, Lou, go ahead. Well, I was really enjoyed your uh, uh, travels through the country uh, 
naming uh, delis in the various cities. I grew up in St. Louis, and I noticed St. Louis didn't make it into your list. Uh, so I'd like to uh, at least put in the name of Copperman's, which was the deli that was downtown in St. Louis that lasted an amazingly long time. I think it's gone now, but it lasted into the uh, 2000s. And uh, I can remember my father and his uh, various compatriots uh, going a couple of blocks in to uh, get lunch at Copperman's. Great. Yeah, so I think there was some guy that did a tour. He just went from state to state. He went cross country eating deli. Um, that, that was David Sachs who wrote the book, Save the Deli. Right, yeah. right. I like that idea. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to say something. Go right ahead. Um, okay. Oh, I remember my father on Sunday after he was cool, he always made hot pastrami sandwiches for us. You know, like pastrami sandwich, but he'd make it, it, it would be nice and warm. I remember that so much, you know? Right. Yeah, and I remember sometimes like, like, like after dinner, you know, you know, now people have ice cream or what other snacks. He used to like to have a pastrami sandwich. In the after evening. dinner. <laughs> yeah, after, <laughs> like a few hours later. <laughs> There's always room for pastrami. Yes, yes. <laughs> Great. This was wonderful. This was wonderful today, yes. Good, well, thank you all for coming. And it's a good way to end Hanukkah. And thank you, Seth, because uh, we really enjoyed it, clearly. Um, and uh, maybe someday we'll all get together and we can eat deli again together. How's that? <laughs> all right. Good night, thank everyone. You. Thank, thank you, you, Seth. Thank you. Okay. Good crowd. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Right. Good night. Good night.